Laura Harvey, head coach of Utah Royals FC. Thank you so much for being part of Three Questions. Thank you for having me. You have previously been with the Seattle Reign, the Arsenal LFC, the Birmingham City LFC. Mm -hmm. How did you know that becoming the first head coach of Utah Royals FC was a perfect fit for you? Uh, honestly, it, w it was Deloy Hansen. He um, brought me here. Um, took me out to dinner, showed me around all the facilities and just listening to his passion and, and drive to want to make women's soccer um, a huge thing in Utah was something that I wanted to be part of. Did you know Deloy before all of this? I didn't. This? He called me randomly. I had a Salt Lake City number come up on my phone and I didn't get one word in for 20 minutes and in that 20 minutes he <laughs> sold me. Did that surprise you? It doesn't surprise any of us who know Deloy Hansen. Yeah, it, it was a definite whirlwind, I would say, that 20-minute phone call. But you could just tell within that that this was going to be something special and, and he was someone that was willing to invest his time and efforts into trying to, trying to make this um, the best it can possibly be. And as a coach, that's all you can ever ask for. Deloy Henson was in here not long ago. We were talking about this very thing and how short a time and what mm -hmm. a whirlwind it was in getting the National Women's Soccer League franchise here in Utah and ultimately you yeah. to come to the team. Um, describe how that whole deal unfolded. Well, I believe Deloy called me minutes after they decided that they were going to have a franchise. And within 48 hours, I was on a plane to Salt Lake from Seattle and I think 24 hours later I signed my contract so yeah it was a definite whirlwind uh, things happen really quickly but I think when you speak to someone like Deloitte and you listen to what his plans are and where he sees the vision of the club it's hard not to buy in real quick. Now you were one of the coaches for Arsenal LFC you've helped to run an academy before mm -hmm. you were the first head coach of Seattle Reign Tell me what it takes to get a new franchise up off the ground and to get a new league, namely the NWSL, off the ground and putting fans in the seats. What does that take? I think there's multiple things that it takes. I, I've always believed that if you put a product on the field, retention's not your issue. It's getting people to know that you exist. So I think that's our first job is getting out there and telling people that we're here and that it's a product that people should come and watch. And then it's our responsibility to make sure that the product that they come and see is something that they want to keep coming to see. Um, so getting players that people want to see, um, putting a style of soccer on the field that people want to see, and then just making sure that the fans feel that it's something that they want to be part of. And I think if you can have all of those things, you have a recipe for success. How critical is it to uh, Utah Royals' success to be affiliated with RSL and to ha have uh, access to a world-class facility like the Academy down in Harriman? What does that mean to your success as a team? Yeah, it sets you up to allow the players to be the best professionals they can be. And I think in women's sports especially, that's all we ever want is, can we be put in an environment that allows you to have the ability to succeed where you're not having to fight just to be able to get onto the field? And here we, we definitely have that. So I think that was something that um, when Deloitte was talking to me, he was constantly asking me, what, what do you need to be successful? And, and outside of us recruiting the right players and making sure that they play well, um, he's provided everything so far to enable us to do that, whether it be the right nutrition, the right training facilities, um, everything that we could possibly need to be the best professionals we can be. We've been given that access. And I think that's the greatest thing about us having the MLS uh, interaction is that there's already something in place that we can access. It's not like it's brand new where it's a completely new club where we don't have anything. We have the things that the RSL have already been using. Um, we have their experiences of things that have happened that have worked really well or things that didn't work so well and they can educate us along the way as well. For the uninitiated, what is the difference, the major difference between professional men's soccer and professional women's soccer? I think straight away, you know, from a male perspective, they're stronger, quicker, uh, faster, uh, more athletically um, able to deal with the strength of the game in different ways. So from a, a women's soccer perspective, 
the game's very much um, technical, tactical, and then we try and work on levels to be able to strengthen ourselves to not just be able to compete, but also prevent injuries um, that throughout female athletes are huge, as an example, an, an ACL injury in the knee. We do a lot of work around prevention of that stuff. So I would say that the game's quicker on the men's side, but I feel like on the women's side, we can go a little bit deeper in the tactical side of the game um, sometimes with, because if we can do that, we can really um, do well at initiating that, where sometimes in the men's game, if they're quicker and stronger than you, then you can't do anything about that. So, so women's soccer is a little more tactical, a little mm -hmm. more of a finesse than you would mm -hmm. find in men's soccer, where it's just power, strength, speed, agility, that kind of thing. Sometimes, and I think actually here in Utah, both teams have a similar style that they actually want to play. Um, you know, speaking to, to Mike and being around some of his training sessions, I think the way that we both see the game is very similar where you try and take away those physical and athletic abilities of opposition by keeping the ball and being possession orientated. Um, so that if teams are quicker and stronger than you, well, you try and counteract that by keeping possession of the ball for a little bit longer. So I think me and Mike had never really met before, but I think speaking to each other um, over the short period of time that we have, we do see the game in a similar way, which is great. Mm. It's going to be fun to see how, yeah. this thing, how this whole relationship uh, works out. You have seen your schedule for the upcoming season, the first season for Utah Royals mm -hmm. FC. Based on what you know about the other teams and the roster that has been put together for Utah Royals, how do you think this first season is going to go? I would say the NWSL is the most competitive league in the world for women's soccer. So every year, no matter what, you know that if you turn up and give a 6 out of 10, you're probably not going to win. You have to be able to perform 8 out of 10 every week just to stand a chance of winning games. And that's what we all love about this league, is it is so competitive. So I think the greatest thing about it is right now, I don't think anyone could tell you who was going to win the league and who wasn't going to be successful because it's so competitive within the teams that are in there that um, any given weekend, everyone can beat everyone. And that's why we love playing in it because it makes us have to be the best we can be every week. Utahns have a lot of options for their disposable income. I mean, mm -hmm. you've been skiing already yes. this season, and there's all kinds of things to do outdoors. Why is soccer, and specifically professional women's soccer, a good investment for Utahns to spend their money and time on? I'd say the biggest thing about the NWSL is you get to see the best players in the world play. Um, and not just on one team, but on multiple teams against each other not just from the US, but from multiple countries around the world. We have the best 1% of players across the world in this league. And that is something that's rare. You know, on the men's side, um, you don't get, get that really in any league around the world. And here in the NWSL, that's something that I think is our biggest selling point is our product. I think that the product that gets put on the field is something that people want to see. Um, and I'm sure that down at the stadium, we're going to create a great environment for the fans. Um, but I truly believe that if we put the right product on the field, then, then the fans are going to be happy. Let's talk about player salaries for just a moment. Mm -hmm. As you well know, player salaries have started out really low in the NWSL yeah. and have grown over time, but still, uh, I believe the cap for an individual player is something like $41,000, yep. something like that. If that is the case, how on earth do players make ends meet? That's not a lot of money. How do they make ends meet? I think the biggest thing is that the reason why the salaries were at where they were originally was the, the biggest aim of the league was to be sustainable. Um, this was the third time a women's professional league had tried in the US and we desperately didn't want it to fail. So we've, we've ticked the first box, we're, su we're surviving and now we're in a position where we want to change surviving to thriving. And I think as someone like Deloitte coming in is changing the narrative of the conversation around the salaries being one of them. And I think the, the way that the players survive is it's, it's their passion, it's their love, it's what they desperately want to do. So they're willing to sacrifice things like our season is a seven month season right now. So in those other five months of the year, they work or they go and play overseas in different leagues around the world just to 
add into that income. So I think one of the things that us as a club is really going to try and um, push is how we can raise salaries across the league, but still by keeping that number one uh, initiative alive, which is to make sure this league survives because that's the most important thing. How important is the television contract for the NWSL when it comes to fan appeal, to player salaries, to overall exposure? Yeah, I think it's huge. I think that the, the lifetime A&E deal that happened last year changed the dynamic of the league a little bit from it being fans just looking for that one-off game that might be on TV to suddenly now they knew every week there was going to be a game. Um, I think that changed the narrative a little bit so fans could interact on a weekly basis knowing that there was going to be a game on um, against someone at some time um, every week. I think the the modern era is that we have a streaming um, option too for the league with um, apps that people can watch on their phones or on their tablets or whatever it might be. And we also have access around the world for people to watch through the NWSL website. So there's multiple platforms that people can watch games on. Um, and that's just nationally. And then each club has their own local um, output that each club's trying to build as well. So I think we're gradually getting in a position where fans know every week that there's somewhere they can watch games, which is great. This is not the very first time that professional women's soccer, a league, has tried to make a go of it. We've had the WUSA and the WPS. What does the NWSL have going for it that those two previous leagues did not? I think initially the US soccer um, backing was huge for this league. Um, the US national team players sit outside of our salary cap and are paid through the federation, which is huge. We also have a partnership with the Canadian uh, Federation, which is a similar thing where they fund their players, which meant then it took a lot of the burden off the ownership groups to not have to pay some of the highest earning players. Um, so I think that as an initial partnership was huge. And I think the TV partnership that's now developed over time is something that's going to keep the league thriving um, and honestly the MLS interaction between multiple teams now is something that I think is going to continue for the future of the league and I think we're at a position now in year six where we want to change the narrative from just making sure we survive to we want to change it to how can we be the best in the world um, and I believe that having a franchise like Utah Rawls is going to be something that allows that to happen. Utah Royals have been practicing now for mm -hmm. several weeks, if not a couple of months, mm -hmm. right? Who should we keep our eye on in the upcoming season? Who's on your roster? Oh, tough one. I think that there's multiple players on our roster who are, who are definitely worth the look for fans. Um, we have the vice captain of the U.S. national team, Becky Sabrin, who is our captain. Um, Amy Rodriguez, who's coming back from a, a big knee surgery, but... Um, I think she's got a huge season ahead of her and we've got multiple international players from around the world who are coming to apply their trade in Utah. So there'll be names that I think fans will want to have on the back of their shirts by the end of the season for sure. You've coached and played uh, what they call football over in Europe. We call it soccer here. You've played and coached over in Europe. Compare, if you will, the two cultures, the European football culture to the U.S. soccer culture. What's the difference? I think from the um, European perspective, it's very territorial. So you could live on one side of the city in a big city in Europe and support a completely different club to someone who lives on the other side of the city. So there becomes a huge rivalry within that territory, if you like. I think in the US, because of how huge the country is, there's, there doesn't tend to be that... Um, territorial thing around it so people just enjoy watching the games and that was something that stood out to me when I first was here that fans from different teams would intermingle within the stadium and that's just something that wouldn't happen back in Europe. Um, they hate each other over they, there don't they? Yeah they hate each other yeah. It's so almost uh, like gang warfare. It, very true depending on who you support. Um, so that was something that jumped out at me and I think that people want to come out to soccer games in the US for it to be an experience. They're not just there for the game. They're there for everything that goes on within that. And I think that um, the NWSL is really trying to um, appreciate that and use that as an advantage to get fans through the door. Because again, I think we have a product on the field that people will want to see, but it's everything around that as well, the whole experience. 
There are two separate cultures when it comes to European football and U.S. soccer. Yep. Which do you prefer? Mm -hmm. I think on the women's side of the game, um, this league is unmatched. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I came here. It's why, one of the reasons why I'm still here is I believe as a coach and as a player, it's the most demanding that you're ever going to work in. Um, and it's the most challenging and it's the most rewarding that you can be around because when you play against the best and you lose or you beat the best, there's no better feeling or worse feeling. Um, so I think that it's, it's something that for any player who, on the women's side especially, who lives outside of the US, one of their uh, bucket list items would be to play soccer in the US. And I think that speaks volumes for why the NWSL is able to attract the players that it does. It has the amount of fans that it already has and it's continuing to thrive forward. This is your first opportunity to live in Utah. You visited yep. once or twice before. What do you think of Utah? Yeah, I love it. I think um, it's, I've come in the right season for me because I, um, I do enjoy skiing a lot. Um, so I'm excited for what the summer might hold, but so far I've loved it. I love the fact that I can get up in the morning and go skiing and still come back in the afternoon and do some work. So uh, that's very new to me. Um, I like the, the culture around the city. I've enjoyed going out and trying different places to eat and drink. So yeah, so far so good. I'm enjoying it. Now you have skied the French Alps because you were born and raised in England. Yeah. Compare the French Alps to Brighton Ski Resort or Solitude <laughs> Ski Resort or the, the Wasatch Mountain Resorts or Utah's resorts? Well, everyone's telling me that the snow this season's been terrible here. Mm -hmm. um, and I skied before the big snowstorm came and I didn't think that the snow was terrible in comparison. <laughs> and then I've skied since the big snowstorm. So um, I can see why people say that Utah has the best snow in the world. I, I would say that Without doubt, it's some of the best snow I've definitely skied on. I've been lucky enough to ski in the French Alps when it's had crazy amounts of snow and not a lot of snow. And uh, definitely the Utah, not a lot of snow. And the French Alps, not a lot of snow. Utah definitely wins. Yeah, so what you're saying is that the French Alps on its best snow day is about half as good as Utah's snow on its worst snow day. Is we'll that go, about right? We'll go with that, yes. We'll okay. go with that. <laughs> well, Laura Harvey, head coach of Utah Royals FC, thank you so much for being part of Three Questions. Thank you so much.